Well, good evening. I'm glad to uh, be debating this topic. I, I agree with, with Zucker that this is important. Most of the debates I do uh, are more clearly related to Jesus or Muhammad, but it is important to keep in mind that we can take these debates back much further, all the way back to the time uh, of Abraham. Uh, so uh, I'm, I'm looking forward to, to this exchange tonight. Uh, I'd like to thank uh, Zakir for representing the Muslim Position tonight and the Muslim Debate Initiative for putting together an interesting series uh, of topics this week. Uh, I'm going to break up my opening statement into uh, a couple of parts. First, uh, I'd like to take a look at the covenant with Abraham in the larger context of, of the Bible, and that's similar to what Zakir has done. He, he, he went to uh, he went to the Quran, he went to other passages in the Bible to look at it in kind of a larger context. I'd like to do that as well. Um, second, um, I'll zero in on the covenant with uh, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob to, to look at exactly what's being maintained uh, in those passages about the covenant with Abraham. And finally, if I have any more time in my opening statement, I'll respond. I'll start responding to some of Zucker's arguments. Uh, I think most of them will have to wait until they're rebuttals. Uh, so, Put the covenant in context, in the context of the Bible as a whole. The first sacrifice in the Bible that we read about was actually by God in Genesis chapter 3. Uh, if you recall, Adam and Eve sinned against God and they tried to cover their nakedness with fig leaves. Um, after God pronounced judgment on them, we read in Genesis 3.21... And the Lord God made for Adam and for his wife garments of skins and clothed them. So Adam and Eve try to cover their nakedness with fig leaves, and then God makes them skins of an animal. And this is important because there was no death, of, there was no animal death in the Garden of Eden. And so if there's an animal killed to make these skins, then God kills an animal and uses the skins to cover Adam and Eve, who had tried to cover the nakedness brought about by their sin with leaves. So God had a different uh, approach in mind. Uh, now, do you know what kind of animal was sacrificed there? Neither do I, the Bible doesn't say. Um, but I, I, I think it was a lamb for several reasons. Some, lots of Christians believe that it was a lamb uh, for several reasons. Uh, lambs happen to make good clothes. Uh, there is a, a, a biblical emphasis throughout the Bible on lambs as sacrificial animals. Um, but even more importantly, the very next <laughs> sacrifice we read about in Scripture, in the next chapter, uh, it looks like the reason God accepts this sacrifice, because God says he accepts this sacrifice, it looks like the reason he accepts it <coughs> is that he was following a pattern that had already been laid down. So I'm referring, of course, to Genesis 4, where we read about the story of, of Cain and Abel. Uh, it says in the first couple of verses that Adam and Eve had uh, these sons, Cain and Abel. Uh, Cain worked the soil, and uh, Abel tended the flocks. And we get to verses 3 through 5, uh, which says, uh, In the course of time, Cain, Cain brought to the Lord, this is what Cain brings, Cain brought to the Lord an offering of the fruit of the ground, and Abel also brought of the firstborn of his flock and of their fat portions. And the Lord had regard for Abel and his offering, but for Cain and his offering he had no regard. So Cain was very angry and his face fell. Cain was angry because God wouldn't accept his offering. But what was Cain's offering? He offered some kind of vegetables from, uh, from the soil. Uh, whose pattern did he end up following, whether knowingly or unknowingly? Remember, Adam and Eve tried to cover their sins with these, uh, with these leaves. Cain offers, uh, a sacri I mean, uh, offers an offering from uh, the fruits of the ground. Abel, on the other hand, sacrificed lambs as an offering to God. And it says that, that God accepted this offering. And why? Well, it seems he's following the pattern by God, where uh, God gave Adam and Eve a different way of, of covering the nakedness brought about by their sin. In... Genesis 22, we'll be talking about this uh, quite a bit tonight. I just want to uh, put it in context here. Uh, in Genesis 22, God commands Abraham to sacrifice his son Isaac. That's what the text says. Abraham takes his son Isaac to the region of Moriah. And as they're walking up 
one of the mountains there, Ab uh, Isaac asks his father Abraham, where is the lamb for the burnt offering? And Abraham answers, God himself will provide the lamb for the burnt offering. Uh, a little later, when Abraham is about to sacrifice his son Isaac, God stops him because God was only testing him. Then Abraham looks and sees a ram caught by its horns, and Abraham offers the ram as a sacrifice. But uh, what about that lamb? Uh, he, 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 had his, he had his offering there in the ram, but Abraham had said that God's going to provide uh, a lamb. And uh, where was it? Abraham's a prophet. Wait for it. Wait for it. In Exodus 12, God is about to strike the Egyptians for stubbornly rejecting his commands. Uh, but he tells Moses and the Israelites that each family or small group of families must sacrifice a lamb and take some of the blood and put it on the doorposts of their homes. God says in Exodus 12, 13, the blood shall be assigned for you on the houses where you live. And when I see the blood, I will pass over you. And no plague will befall you to destroy you when I strike the land of Egypt. So the Israelites were saved from destruction by the blood of the Lamb. In Isaiah 53, the prophet Isaiah tells us that someone is going to be sacrificed for sins. I suggest reading the entire chapter, uh, but let me read verses 4 through 8. It says, Surely he has borne our griefs and carried our sorrows, yet we esteemed him stricken, smitten by God, and afflicted. But he was pierced for our transgressions, he was crushed for our iniquities. Upon him was the chastisement that brought us peace, and with his wounds we are healed. All we like sheep have gone astray, we have turned every one to his own way, and the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. He was oppressed and he was afflicted, yet he opened not his mouth. Like a lamb that is led to the slaughter, and like a sheep that, is, that before its shears is silent, so he, up, so he opened not his mouth. By oppression and judgment he was taken away, and as for his generation, who considered that he was cut off out of the land of the living, stricken for the transgression of my people? According to Isaiah, someone would be pierced for our transgressions, and he would accept his punishment like a lamb led to the slaughter. But who would be this sacrifice for sins, the Old Testament revelation stops in uh, around 430 B.C., the book of Malachi. Uh, then there was silence, and for more than 400 years, Jews had to wait for another prophet. All of a sudden, another prophet appeared. Uh, his name was John the Baptist. He was very similar to some of the prophets in the Old Testament. And people came to him from everywhere. They wanted to hear uh, a message from God, and they had been waiting a long time. People were so impressed with John the Baptist that they asked him if he was the Messiah. John said, no, I've been sent to prepare the way for him. I baptize you with water, but he will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and with fire. I'm not fit to carry his sandals. For a while, John went around baptizing people until one day he saw Jesus walking towards him. And John said in John 129, Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. The Apostle Paul, reflecting on all of this, tells his readers in 1 Corinthians 5, 7 to 8, Christ, our Passover Lamb, has been sacrificed, therefore let us keep the festival. In Revelation 13, we read about uh, a demonic beast that would be worshipped by many people. Uh, who would worship the beast, we read in Revelation 13, 8, All who dwell on the earth will worship him, everyone whose name has not been written from the foundation of the world in the book of life of the Lamb who has been slain. Uh, from these passages, we can learn two things. First, from Genesis to Revelation, it's all about the Lamb. From Genesis to Revelation. Lamb, 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 Lamb. It's hammering this message home. Second, from the first human beings, Adam and Eve, all the way to some of the last human beings, uh, during the end times, people try to do things their own way, not God's way. Uh, God's path can be as plain as day 
accompanied by miracles, and people will still say, sorry, I don't like that, I would rather go with this other way over here. Now, let's take a closer look at God's covenant with Abraham. Uh, we've seen that scripture is consistently and ultimately pointing towards the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. God's covenant with Abraham, so we've seen the, the, the larger picture of biblical revelation. God's covenant with Abraham is simply this. Abraham, you get to be an important part of this unfolding <coughs> message of salvation. That's God's covenant there. <coughs> In Genesis 12, 3, God says that all the families of the earth will be blessed in Abraham. In 12, 7, God tells Abraham that his descendants will possess the land of Canaan. God repeats his promise to give the land to Abraham's descendants in Genesis 13, where he also promises to multiply Abraham's descendants like the dust of the earth. But how is God going to do all of this? He doesn't say it. He doesn't tell us. He tells Abraham sort of the big picture of what he's going to do, but he doesn't get into specifics. Um, so Abraham doesn't know either. Uh, in Genesis 15, he even asks God, uh, what can you possibly do for me since I don't have a son? God's making all these promises. Abraham is still uh, childless. So God says in verse 4, one who will come forth from your own body, he shall be your heir. One who will come forth from your own body, he shall be your heir. So the heir is going to be a certain individual. But which one? Well, we don't know yet. The, the scripture doesn't tell us at this point. So let's see which son becomes the heir. Something interesting happens in Genesis, Genesis 16. Uh, God had promised to give Abraham an heir, but Abraham's wife Sarah, still called uh, Sarai uh, at this point, was old and childless. So she and Abraham uh, hatched a plan, decided to do things uh, their own way. We've seen that human beings consistently try to do things their own way. People have trouble uh, waiting for God or, uh, or doing things God's way sometimes. Uh, Hagar became pregnant and Ishmael was born. Um, so Abraham now had a son. Was this going to be the heir God had promised, the one who would possess the land, the son of the covenant? And I say absolutely not. Um, God tells Abraham in the next chapter that he has other plans and that Sarah would have a son. Now, um, Zachar quoted a couple of verses from this passage, uh, passages about Ishmael, about uh, Abraham, wanting Ishmael to walk before God, and about God promising to bless Ishmael. Let's read the entire passage in context, and we'll see what the role of Ishmael is here. So Genesis 17, uh, verses 15 to 21. Then God said to Abraham, As for Sarai, your wife, you shall not call her name Sarai, but Sarah shall be her name. I will bless her, and indeed I will give you a son by her. Then I will bless her, and she shall be a mother of nations. Kings of peoples will come from her. Then Abraham fell on his face and laughed and said in his heart, Will a child be born to a man 100 years old? And will Sarah, who is 90 years old, bear a child? And Abraham said to God, Oh, that Ishmael might live before you. That was, the, uh, that was uh, Abraham's request, right? Abraham said to God, Oh, that Ishmael might live before you. But God said, No, but Sarah, your wife, will bear you a son, and you shall call his name Isaac, and I will establish my covenant with him for an everlasting covenant for his descendants after him. As for Ishmael, I have heard you. Behold, I will bless him, and I will make him fruitful, and will multiply him exceedingly. He shall become the father of twelve princes, and I will make him a great nation. But my covenant I will establish with Isaac, whom Sarah will bear to you at this season next year. Now, all of that, when we read it in context, sounded perfectly clear to me. Did God say, I'm going to establish my covenant with Ishmael? 
Or did he say, I'm going to establish my covenant equally with uh, all of Abraham's <coughs> sons? No. Even when Abraham specifically requests that Ishmael would walk before God, uh, God says he has other things in mind. He promises to bless Ishmael. I agree with that. He promises to make him a great nation. I agree with that. But the covenant, the everlasting covenant, is through Isaac. That's not according to me. That's according to the scriptures in the very passage that Zachar was using to support his position. <coughs> Uh, as further supports, we can look throughout, uh, throughout the rest of Genesis and see how God continues these promises. Uh, in Genesis 26, now Abraham is dead. Abraham died in chapter 25. And by the way, by Genesis 25, everything that had been promised about Ishmael was already fulfilled. So the idea with Ishmael, the idea with Ishmael is, Abraham, you've promised, you, 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 I will bless him, I'll make him a great nation, 12 princes are going to come, and that's exactly what we find by Genesis <coughs> chapter 25 has already happened. But things continue with Isaac and with Jacob. So in Genesis 26, uh, there's, a, there's a famine and uh, Isaac is worried about it, and we read, the Lord appeared to him and said, do not go down to Egypt. Stay in the land of which I shall tell you. Sojourn in this land, and I will be with you and bless you. For to you and to your descendants I will give all these lands, and I will establish the oath which I swore to your father Abraham. I will multiply your descendants as the stars of heaven, and will give your descendants all these lands. And by your descendants all the nations of the earth shall be blessed. Because Abraham obeyed me and kept my charge, my commandments, my statutes, and my laws. Notice, God repeats all of the promises that he made to Abraham to Isaac. Does he do that with Ishmael? Does he come to, does he come to Ishmael and repeat all of the promises given to Abraham? No, he does it with Isaac. And notice that it's through Isaac that God is going to to uh, bless all the nations of the earth. Zachar said, no, it has to be. It has to be uh, through Ishmael to ultimately get to Muhammad. Well, the, the same book of the Bible that he's quoting says otherwise. says it's through Isaac, and this is, this is God speaking here. Um, and we read, when we go on, to Jacob. So Isaac has a son, Jacob. And we read uh, uh, in Genesis chapter 28, 13 to 14, and behold, the Lord stood above it and said, I am the Lord, the God of your father Abraham and the God of Isaac. The land on which you lie, I will give it to you and to your descendants. Your descendants will also be like the dust of the earth, and you will spread out to the west and to the east and to the north and to the south, and in you and in your descendants shall all the families of the earth be blessed. So I don't actually know how this could be any more clear, given what the text says. God goes to Abraham and says, Abraham, I'm establishing my covenant with your son Isaac. It's not with Ishmael. Then God comes to Isaac and says, Isaac, my covenant's with you. It's in you that all the families of the earth are going to be blessed. Then Isaac has a son, Jacob. God comes to him and says, it's through you that all the families of the earth are going to be blessed. Somehow, Zachar reads these passages and says, clearly, it must be Ishmael. I don't know how. I don't know how you read that and conclude this. Um, but we can take it a step further, because we don't just have Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. We see uh, some of the fulfillment coming in the time of Moses. In uh, the book of Exodus, in Exodus, we see that uh, the Israelites, so if, if I, I'm assuming most of you are familiar with the story, but just in case you aren't, um, I've got about two and a half minutes left. Um, God also promises Abraham that his <coughs> descendants, the descendants he's referring to who are going to take the land, are going to go down to the land of Egypt. They're going to go to the land of Egypt, they're going to suffer for 400 years, and they're going to come out of Egypt. And then they're going to possess the land. Now watch what God says in Exodus chapter 3, verses 6 through 8. So this is God speaking. 
It says, and he said, I am the God of your father, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. And Moses hid his face, for he was afraid to look at God. Then the Lord said, I have surely seen the affliction of my people who are in Egypt. So God's people are in Egypt. And have heard their cry because of their taskmasters. I know their sufferings, and I have come down to deliver them out of the hand of the Egyptians, and to bring them up out of that land to a good and broad land, a land flowing with milk and honey, to the place of the Canaanites, the Hittites, the Amorites, the Perizzites, the Hivites, and the Jebusites. And now, behold, the cry of the people of Israel has come to me, and I've also seen the oppression with which the Egyptians oppressed them. Uh, in Deuteronomy chapter 1, uh, verses 8 and 10, we read, See, I have set the land before you. Go in and take possession of the land that the Lord swore to your fathers, to Abraham, to Isaac, and to Jacob, to give them and to their offspring after them. The Lord your God has multiplied you, and behold, you are today as numerous as the stars of heaven. So, um, I don't see, again, I don't see anything confusing here from the Bible. There is, uh, I'll, I'll respond in the, in the rebuttals to, to some of Zucker's points, but the overall picture that we have here, God talks to Abraham, Abraham uh, has, has a son that he really likes, um, and, and, and for the record, I won't dispute that uh, Ishmael was a legitimate son of, uh, of Abraham, and so I agree with you that people should not even be, uh, even Christians should not even be uh, using that sort of argument. Uh, the only point is the covenant was not with Ishmael, the covenant was through Isaac. God made promises, not a covenant. A covenant is different. A covenant is where God says, you're going to do this, and I'm going to do this. And if you get out of line, I'm going to bring you back to what you promised. Uh, a promise of God is where he just says, I'm going to do this. It doesn't matter what the other person does. God says he's going to do that. And we see that every promise God made about Ishmael is fulfilled by Genesis 25. So how do you say that this must refer to something that happened thousands of years later with the coming of Muhammad? I don't think you can, at least not based uh, on these texts. Chapter 17 of Genesis. Every male among you shall be circumcised. And Zakar has made uh, quite a bit out of the fact that Ishmael was circumcised. So was everyone in Abraham's household. So were the servants, every, every male in his household. Everyone who was with him was circumcised. Does this mean that they are all part of the covenant? Well, now we're, now we're, uh, uh, now we're equivocating on what the covenant is. Uh, the covenant, who it's traced through, the lineage that it's traced through, that is guaranteed to be through Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Uh, but all the people in Abraham's household, everyone in Isaac's household, everyone in Jacob's household, uh, was to be circumcised. This doesn't mean they're part of the promised covenant. It's only in the sense that they're, uh, that they're offspring of, uh, of Abraham. So where, what does that have to do with anything? Does this mean that, 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 that the servants, uh, that prophets are going to come from those servants because they were, they were circumcised? No, that has nothing to do with the passage. It's just saying God ordered him to circumcise everyone in his household, and there in the very same passage is where he tells him that the covenant is with, uh, is with Isaac. Um, he says, why, not, why, why circumcise Ishmael if he's not part of the covenant? Because he was commanded to. Because he was commanded to. Again, if you say that somehow means that uh, the covenant is with Ishmael, that would make the covenant with everyone, uh, pretty much every Jew who's ever been circumcised, and uh, Abraham's servants as well. Uh, but we're missing one thing in that, uh, in that passage. He said that part of the covenant, part of the covenant is that the circumcision must take place on the eighth day. Now, if, if, it's, if it's Ishmael or with Abraham who are already older, uh, there's no problem. But from that time on, children who are born as part of the covenant would be circumcised on the eighth day. And in Islam, there's, there's generally no pattern. You could be circumcised when you're, you're five days old, ten days old, a year old, uh, whatever. It's Jews who maintain uh, this eighth day. And so why don't, why don't Muslims have to fulfill what was part of the required covenant if this applies to Muslims? Um, he said, et should be translated as together. Uh, I, I know you can look up in a, in a dictionary and find all kinds of meanings, but no one translates the passage that way. Why? Because it makes absolutely no sense in context. It makes absolutely no sense that God is putting all of this emphasis on Isaac, that Ishmael is being expelled from the house. Think about it. And according to Zakhar's interpretation, this covenant is equally, at least, with, with Isaac and with Ishmael. Probably even greater emphasis on Ishmael, since the ultimate fulfillment through Muhammad is going to come through Ishmael. Uh, why? Well, get out of here, Ishmael. 
I'm focusing on Isaac. Why? Why? That's, that's why it makes absolutely no sense in the context. Uh, Zachar says that uh, the covenant was mainly with the Jews uh, at that time, but later it was uh, through Muslims. Let me see if I got this, uh, if I got this straight, according to Zachar's interpretation here. The covenant is somehow equally, or, or even more so, uh, with, with Ishmael, but let's say it's, just, it's, it's with both. It's with both Isaac and with Ishmael. Uh, God's going to bless everyone in the world through uh, both of them. Then what does God do? He gives very clear passage after very clear passage saying Isaac, 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 and then comes to Isaac and says it, and then comes to Jacob and says it, very clearly, indisputable as to the meanings of these passages, not some vague reference to some land that God says, and something good is going to happen here, no, that must be Muhammad. No, very clear passages. So God does that with Isaac, but not with Ishmael. Uh, then, not only does God do that, he also, from then on, whenever, whenever the Jews start veering towards polytheism, he brings them back. He punishes them and brings them back. Then they veer again, and he punishes them and brings them back. He's placing a lot of emphasis. He's sending this constant supply of prophets to rebuke them and bring them back to pure monotheism. But according to Zakr, it seems that uh, God entirely forgets about this covenant for a couple thousand years, and the Ishmaelites become pagans and polytheists, and more than 2,000 years later, God suddenly remembers, oh, wait a minute, I was supposed to be putting a lot of emphasis on Ishmael, too. Good thing I remembered now. Really, clear passages about Isaac, Jacob, Moses, totally ambiguous passages that have nothing to do uh, with Muhammad or Islam, and then God puts all of the emphasis on uh, making sure the descendants of Isaac and Jacob are these strict monotheists, and then just totally forgets about Ishmael. Ishmael goes off and we know where we hear practically nothing about him or his descendants for a long time. Uh, very strange. Um, as far as uh, Muslims uh, having the land, um, Look at what's promised. The, the, the land that's promised, the land that's promised, it says the land of the Canaanites and so on, the Perizzites, the Jebusites, all these people. Then when Moses comes out through the Exodus, that's where God sends them. It says he sends them to that land. If you as Muslims say uh, that, it, that it's, it's, it's Muslims who have always had this land, uh, I mean, even, just read the Quran, please. Surah 532, probably the most quoted passage of the Quran in the United States, um, says... That uh, if you, well, when, when the way it actually gets presented is that God says, if anyone kills a man, it's as if he has killed all mankind. But what it actually says is that God gave to the children of Israel that if anyone kills a man apart from making mischief in the land, then it's as if he has killed all mankind. Wait a minute. Where do Jews get to carry out Jewish law? Where do Jews get to carry out Jewish law and punish people who are making mischief in their land? What land is that talking about in the Quran? Is it talking about China? Is it Australia? Obvious, it's obvious what that land is. It says that Jews have authority to establish their law in that land and punish people who make mischief in their land. So if, 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 it's, if the land's not, if it's land's not for the Jews, I, I, I mean, you're not just uh, destroying the, the Bible there, it's also the Quran. He says, uh, Zachar says that in Deuteronomy 33, when it says Lord, it actually means Muhammad. Again, I mean, I don't, I, I, I try to be more, I try, I try, personally, I try to be careful. When I read the word Yahweh, the Jews won't even say, they will not even say the word that is so holy. Um, but then to look at the word Yahweh, the Lord, Yahweh came. That's Muhammad. It's just some kind of figure of speech. Well, you're telling me that God is a very unclear communicator because he could have said a prophet. Could have said a prophet is coming. Um, Zachar points out that, that, that I pointed out that this is, this is past tense, and he said, well, Isaiah is presented in past tense. Uh, yeah, that's, that's correct, but if you look at what, 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 I, what I said there, the past tense here is obviously referring to what just happened. This is Deuteronomy 33. They just went through the Exodus, and then... God, it says the Lord came, and the Lord, the Lord was going on this pillar of fire. Um, it says the Lord came from these places that they just passed through. So obviously, what are you going to say this means? It says the Lord comes from these places. What does he mean? I don't know, that as the pillar of fire just came through these places, it just happened. It just happened. That's what this means. 
Past tense. They just witnessed it. It just happened. It was fresh in everyone's <coughs> mind. Zacher somehow looks at this passage and says, oh, and it says, Lord, and it talks about all these places the pillar of fire had just gone through. It's actually talking about prophet. Again, compare. Compare the differences here between the clear messages to Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, Moses, and these strange, how desperate do you have to be to say, it says Lord, but it means Muhammad. <coughs> Very strange. Uh, he, and, and just for another example, he says, well, uh, it says, Kedar, but people will shout from the mountaintops. People are going to shout from the mountaintops in, in Kedar, and Muslims, uh, Muslims shout for joy. And therefore, it must be talking about Islam. Seriously, read through the pro read through the Old Testament prophets. Oh, they talk about all these lands and all these things that are going to be happening. All kinds of things are going to be happening all over the known world. Every place that Jews knew about, they say, they prophesy about things that are going to happen there. Are there prophets in all these lands? No. And how desperate do you have to be to say people are going to rejoice there? Must be talking about Islam. If these are the pass, if these are the only passages we have, and this message contradicts everything we everything else we read in the Bible, which has again clear revelation about the Lamb of God throughout the throughout the Bible. Um, I don't know what method we are using here. Uh, he says that Baca is some unknown desert place, and well, of course, it's. It's, it's dry in Mecca, therefore this, this, this must be about, about Islam. Really, dry place must be about Islam. Uh, it says you're passing through Baca on your way to Zion. This is, if you want to say it's a desert place, fine. I don't even care if you want to say it's Mecca, but Mecca is not the goal. The goal is getting to Zion. Uh, he says that, that the covenant was conditional for Jews, but that God uh, took the land and gave it to the Muslims. Well, did God then take it from the Muslims and give it back? Uh, I mean, how, I'd like to know how you reconcile that, right? Because, I mean, if we're just looking at history and not, and not looking at, you know, the biblical covenants, if you're just going to say, well, God obviously took it from them, well, did God obviously take it back? And if we're just going to kill the history, I'm, 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 not, I'm not saying anything about, about the dispute, uh, about the dispute over the land, but I'm saying, if you're just saying, God obviously took it because Arabs got it, well, Arabs don't got it now. All right, again, Zakhar brings up a lot of points. One that, that, that I didn't really get a chance to answer. I normally be giving a conclusion here, but uh, I don't want to leave this hanging out there. Uh, about Jesus, um, Jesus having no earthly father, uh, we know what his human ancestry is. We know his, where his physical nature uh, ultimately came from, and it goes back. We have the genealogy um, all the way back to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Uh, so I, I don't see how this could be uh, any kind of significant problem. Uh, he says, I, he continues to say, I can't quote the Bible until I resolve the difficulties. The point was absolutely well made about the inconsistency. Zakhar quotes the Bible over and over and over and over again. Any point, any point in there that he can get to agree with them, even if it's massive stretches of interpretation, uh, we are supposed to take uh, at face value as some kind of uh, establishment of Islam and the prophethood of Muhammad. Every verse that disagrees with the Islamic position, obviously, obviously corrupt, can't trust that, can't, uh, uh, just can't trust the Bible. And uh, I can't quote anything in the Bible. Um, total inconsistency, total inconsistency. And think uh, about that method. If, if that's the method, you could, you could prove anything to anyone. I could go to any book, anyone's scriptures, open them up and say, uh, hey, everything I agree with, that's good scripture. All these other things that I don't agree with, you've got a problem, you can't quote it to me. Um, very strange. Uh, and I'll just go ahead, I'll just go ahead and add, if we're, uh, if we're going to point, I mean, if we're going to point this out, in, uh, in the Quran, chapter 5, verse 43, uh, God asks, why are they coming to you, Muhammad, when they have the Torah? Well, according to Zakir, the Torah is filled with these errors and contradictions. Why? is God saying, Muhammad, they don't need you, they've got the Torah. Why does Surah 5, verse 68 say, we have no ground to stand upon if we do not stand upon the Torah and the Gospel? How can we stand upon a corrupt book? And if the book is corrupt, as it is, according to Zakir, then we have no ground to stand upon, according to Islam. Uh, and by the way, uh, Zakir's prophet, Muhammad, when a copy of the Torah was brought to him, swore that it was the word of God. He said, I believe in you and in the one who revealed you. So notice, according to Zakir, Muhammad was affirming a corrupt book. Um, so what we've seen here this evening is uh, very simple. 
You've seen over and over and over again clear messages, Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, Moses, all the way down to Jesus, clear statements of God's uh, affirmation. When it comes to something about Ishmael's descendants, it's, oh, something's going to happen over there in the leader of, in, in, in Kedar. Uh, people are going to go through the Valley of Baca. This must be talking about Mecca. And not only is it talking about Mecca, it must be talking about Muhammad and Islam. Totally unclear, uh, totally unclear passages that no one who ever re read these, any of these passages would ever conclude has anything to do with Islam unless you start with Islam, start with the assumption that Islam is true, and then go back looking for something, anything, that will justify concluding that the covenant was, is with Isaac, and you just don't <coughs> have anything. Now, uh, Zakir had the first word, and we'll now have our last word. Well. <coughs> Folks, I'm very, very disappointed tonight. I asked the question four times, how is Jesus the seed of Abraham when he had no father? I don't think anybody heard the response. I asked him again and again, was Ishmael 17? who mocked Isaac and was sent to Arabia? Or was he a baby being carried to Arabia? Which means he went to Arabia before Isaac was born. Hence, Genesis has a fabricated story in it, which Paul quoted. Paul quoted a fabricated story. So if you got this in your Bible, then you're quoting from a forged document. He says, I'm quoting from his Bible and I'm making my case. But the point is, if I'm quoting from your Bible and making a case, your job is to refute it. Your Bible is not my book. I'm quoting your Bible against you, same way you quote our Quran against us. Number two, he mentions all oh, we got the genealogies of Jesus. Which genealogy have you got of Jesus? You got two genealogies of Joseph. Was Joseph the father of Jesus? No. So what genealogy you got? Then he mentions Surah 543. Oh, the Quran says, don't they have the Torah? The background story of that is the Jews they had a, adult, um, a person who committed adultery and a woman and they brought them to the Prophet to be judged and Allah's basically sh showing sarcasm that they got the Torah why are they coming to you when they don't even believe you're a true Prophet and the Torah Allah was talking about was the rule of stoning which is still there in the book of um, in the first five books of Moses is still there so Allah was talking about the stoning then he quotes Surah 568 but he only quotes two sentences he leaves the last sentence judged by the Torah, the Gospel, and what Allah has revealed, the Quran. So they say, how can we judge by the Torah and the Gospel when we haven't got it? You Muslims claim it's corrupt and lost. Well, the Quran gives you the answer in Surah 548 by using the Quran as a Muhammad, exactly what I've done tonight. Then he says the Prophet showed respect to the Torah. Notice he never said the Prophet showed respect to the Bible, to the Torah. I show respect to the Torah. You showed me that. I'll say, yes, I believe in what God revealed to the Jews. What he revealed to Moses? Come and then he says the passages are quoted wrong. Clear, no, they're clear cut. And I even said this in James White debate: the prophecies I brought up are more clearer than the Christian prophecies. And I, I'll challenge you to that debate as well. But obviously, we'll get Muhammad's prophet, um, prophet out of the way, and we'll deal with that in that debate. But it's funny because the Jews say the same thing to you lot about unclear passages. Tell us how old Hosea 11 is a prophecy of Jesus. So I don't understand. So, folks, he didn't, un he didn't qu um, answer any of my points. He avoided them because he can't answer them. He tried to say the contradiction of Ishmael's age is not there. But I quoted Rashi, I quoted the Jewish study Bible, who mentioned that the original Hebrews got this contradiction. It's no secret, but these apologists are experienced, you see. When they can't answer the question, they're silent on it. Or they're spinning, uh, spinning around. But people who watch this on YouTube are going to know you avoid my questions. So, folks, my original arguments were for God promised a prophet, scripture, and the pilgrimage to Makkah to Ishmael's descendants. The Quran claims that I brought biblical proofs, he did not refute anything. As far as um, Deuteronomy chapter 33 saying the Lord, are you not aware? I quoted Hosea 12, which says it was an angel who wrestled with Jacob, but Genesis said it was God. So, did God lose a wrestling match with Jacob, according to you? What do they think of God? God lost the wrestling match to Jacob according to them. And also, you should have told that to Stephen, because in Genesis, in the uh, book of Exodus, it said, Yahweh appeared to, uh, to Moses in the burning bush. But according to Stephen, in Acts chapter 7, there was an angel 
So um, Stephen didn't know that the word Yahweh always literally means God. So folks, people who watch this on YouTube and see this debate, they will know he avoided most of my questions. So the covenant was with Ishmael and Isaac. We love them both. They were both prophets. It's not Ishmael or Isaac or Jesus or Muhammad. Truth stands out from error. Assalamu alaikum. Fantastic, or should I say brilliant, as you guys like to say in England. Um, but thanks for coming out and discussing this, uh, for being part of this discussion, these important questions. Um, let's give one more round of applause for our speakers tonight. They did a good job.